Good afternoon, everyone. I was waiting for the on-air signal and the uh, clock to turn 1.30, but uh, thanks for everybody for being here. This is the uh, Ways and Means Committee meeting. I am uh, John Quincy, chair of the committee, and joined by Councilmember uh, Yang, uh, Councilmember Bender, and Councilmember Andrew Johnson. Uh, Councilmember uh, Elizabeth Glidden is not going to be joining us today. She's out of town today on city business, so we wish her a, a safe return. And Councilmember Paul Masano will be joining us quickly, but we are a, a quorum of the committee and we can begin. Um, there's uh, 29 items on our consent agenda in addition to the public hearing and then a few discussion items uh, later. So if I could begin with the consent items. Um, the first is a series of legal settlements. Uh, item number three is the Creative City Roadmap uh, work group. Uh, we have uh, from the Convention Center work on the audio system upgrade project, exhibit hall, wall painting project, and irrigation improvement projects. Finance Department brings forward items on the uh, mill quarter ramp space lease uh, contract with Verizon Wireless. A uh, amendment to a contract with MnDOT for the Minnesota Department of Transportation lease amendment. Item number nine is the uh, amendment uh, number two to the traffic maintenance building renovation project. The health department is bringing forward uh, two items. One is the uh, staple food ordinance research project grant authorizing that contract with the University of Minnesota. As also authorizing a contract with Hennepin County related to the school-based clinic program grant. Uh, Information Technology Department brings forward an item related to the Public Works Automated Dispatch Locating System. Uh, Community Development Regulatory Services Committee is bringing forward our items on the Metropolitan Council Livable Communities Demonstration Accounts, LCDAs, and Livable Community Demonstration Accounts, and the TOD grants. Item number 14 is the Spring 2015 Environmental Grant Funding Applications. And uh, item number 15 is the uh, final holding uh, rent billing for Laurel Village project uh, on that uh, TIF uh, related item. Referred from the executive committee is a new appointed position for director of transportation planning and programming. So we're gonna make a slight title change in this, uh, in this action today to that position. Also a newly appointed position to manager of field support. Civil Service Commission is we're setting a public hearing for May 11th in this committee to consider reappointment for some uh, members of the Civil Service Commission for three year terms and setting a public hearing for May 11th for the Civil Service. Uh, this is a, a reappointment of another person on that same commission. The Public Safety, Civil Rights and Emergency Management Committee bring forward a number of items. One is the Downtown Summer Community Engagement Pilot with Downtown Improvement District. We also have the 2015 MPD Safety Initiative. This is the Joint Enforcement Team, the Jet Patrols. We have a contract with County of uh, Hennepin on behalf of Hennepin County Sheriff's Office for jail fees contract. Uh, very payment terms, very good for the city. Uh, Jada Toys is a contract uh, permitting them to produce and market die cast replicas of our MPD patrol vehicles, and uh, canine veterinary control care. This is authorizing a contract with the University of Minnesota College of Veterinary Medicine for our canine officers. Uh, University of Minnesota Summer Concerts is also a contract with the University of Minnesota for security at those concerts to be staged at TCF Bank Stadium. Transportation and Public Works Committee is bringing forward a number of uh, street projects. One is a Street Resurfacing Project, 31st Street East, the Street Renovation Project, 26th Avenue North, uh, the 7th Street Ramp Project Agreement, as well as accepting uh, Federal Highway Safety Improvement Program funds for uh, that uh, Federal Highway Safety Improvement Program funding stream. We also have the acceptance of uh, two low bids and two single bids for various construction projects associated with it. So on those items on the consent agenda, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. And opposed, those items are brought forward. I think we can now turn our attention to the public hearing. 
This is the uh, city of Minneapolis and a public hearing for the CenturyLink franchise. And uh, we're gonna invite Mr. Bradley up or Mr. Lively first. Thank you, Chair Quincy, members of the committee. I'm Matt Lively, Interim Director in the Communications Department. As you know, in January, uh, the city received a cable franchise application from CenturyLink. Following the public hearing and a thorough review of the franchise application, the city council directed staff in March to negotiate a franchise with CenturyLink and bring it back to committee for consideration. That action did not grant a franchise. And since that time, staff have negotiated a proposed franchise, which is before you today. That work was led by Peter Ginder in the city attorney's office, along with Mike Bradley, the city's outside counsel on cable issues. Mike will walk us through the proposed CenturyLink cable franchise in just a minute. And that will lead in today's into today's public hearing on the proposed franchise. After the hearing today, we're requesting that this committee take action to either approve or deny the franchise and direct staff to prepare findings of fact consistent with the committee's uh, decision. And as a note, because state law does require seven days between today's public hearing and any council action on a franchise, once committee acts today, this will not be on the agenda for this Friday, but will be on the full council agenda for May 15th. At this point, I'd like to introduce Mike Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Lively. Welcome, Mr. Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee. Good afternoon. Thank you, Matt, for the introduction. <clears throat> um, like Matt said, my name is uh, Mike Bradley. I'm with the law firm of Bradley, Hagen, and Gullickson. I, am, I serve as outside counsel on cable franchising issues for the city. Um, and today I'm going to uh, go over the negotiated um, uh, key terms of the uh, negotiated franchise with CenturyLink and then also identify uh, a couple of issues associated with it. As Matt said, there's there's been a process leading up to today, and um, you'll recall that CenturyLink uh, indicated that they'd like to apply for a cable franchise with the city. When that happened, the city published a notice of intent to franchise, and in that notice of intent to franchise, it had a, a, a deadline for submission of applications, as well as a, a date where we would have a public hearing on that franchise application. Uh, CenturyLink did submit a, a franchise application within the time period allowed by the Notice of Intent to Franchise, and we held the public hearing here at the City and, and the Ways and Means Committee at the uh, on the date and time indicated in that Notice of Intent to Franchise. Following the public hearing then, um, City staff and myself uh, drafted a cable officer report. That report was received and filed by the City, and staff was then um, authorized to negotiate a cable franchise uh, with CenturyLink consistent with the uh, cable officer report. Uh, and that brings us uh, through to today. In the, um, in the staff report and public hearing process, um, we really identified several key issues um, to address here in the, uh, in the franchise with CenturyLink. The first being a reasonable build out of the city. Um, another being uh, the prohibition of economic redlining or the identification of, of uh, serving neighborhoods uh, based on the, the income levels of those neighborhoods. Um, the state has a level playing field statute that we need to be mindful of and that requires that no new cable franchise be more favorable or less burdensome as it relates to franchise fees, peg fees or peg support PEG standing for Public Educational and Governmental uh, Access Television, um, and the area served. Another issue identified uh, at the public hearing and, and in the cable officer report is uh, uh, a need for um, culturally diverse programming. Uh, and then finally, uh, we would consider the, the existing Comcast franchise as well. So there's two, what I would consider significant issues um, before you today when you decide to move the uh, cable franchise uh, forward or not, or to deny it. Uh, the first is uh, federal preemption. As you know, um, uh, CenturyLink has been very clear from the time it submitted its application that it believed that the state, um, the state law in the Minnesota Cable Act that requires that a new franchisee 
construct its cable system within five years of the grant of a franchise was preempted by federal law. So specifically the Federal Cable Act and an FCC order that we've referred to as a 621 order that was issued in 2007. The cable officer report indicated that, that CenturyLink has a good faith basis for making that claim and that they would fully indemnify and defend the city um, for any grant of a franchise that, um, that recognized or did not include the, um, the mandatory build language uh, set forth in, in state statute. Um, the, the next issue then is, does this franchise contain a reasonable build out requirement for the entire city? As, um, as you'll recall, the Federal Cable Act allows the city to require the, uh, the build out of its city um, over a reasonable period of time. Um, that takes us then to, um, to that main question of the reasonable build out of the city. Uh, I think it is important uh, to recognize and the franchise uh, recognizes that CenturyLink has constructed a communication system throughout the city already. And uh, it's a legacy system that is capable of serving uh, telephone service and internet service, um, as well in portions of the city cable service um, uh, to city residents. But when we're talking about the build out of the system, we're, we're talking about upgrading the system so that it's fully capable of providing cable service to all of the residents in the city. So the goal of the, of the, the build out language is to have the entire city served over a five year period of time. We, we intentionally kept the term of this agreement short so that we could uh, monitor how CenturyLink is building out the system over time. The build out is based on uh, market success of the uh, of CenturyLink. Market success is is really defined as how, how large a penetration uh, CenturyLink has in the city on the based on the number of residents that's capable of serving. Um, and then uh, CenturyLink has indicated and committed to um, constructing a, a significant portion of its system to serve. Um, citizens that fall below the median income of the city. <coughs> the franchise has a, uh, an initial mandatory minimum build of the city consisting of 15% of, um, of the city households over a period of two years. Um, I can tell you that um, there was a significant amount of discussions between um, city staff and, and CenturyLink over uh, over that particular number, um, and I can tell you that uh, this was their bottom line moving forward. They would not uh, move off of 15% over two years. That being said, there was a number of other um, provisions in the franchise that that uh, would accelerate the, the build of the city uh, over a reasonable period of time, and I'll go over those uh, provisions as well. Um, as part of the, the build out of the city, CenturyLink has to uh, make its best efforts to um, complete its initial build of the city um, in a shorter period of time than two years. It must deploy to households in every ward of the city, and it must include a significant number of households that fall below the median income. And of course, CenturyLink is permitted to serve more than the uh, contractually mandated um, initial build. CenturyLink has also agreed to have quarterly meetings, and this is the way to accelerate the build, build out of the city. So starting on January 1, 2016, CenturyLink uh, is required to meet with the cable officer every quarter. And at that time, CenturyLink will provide information showing the number of subscribers that it's capable of currently serving at that time, and then the number of subscribers that are actually um, subscribing to CenturyLink's um, service. That will give the, uh, the cable officer the opportunity to, um, to examine how quickly this, the, uh, the system is being built out. It will also give the cable officer the opportunity to see if CenturyLink is complying with um, the prohibition against economic redlining. Um, and as part of that, CenturyLink has agreed uh, specifically to, to show maps and to provide other information that will show exactly where uh, in the city, CenturyLink is capable of providing its services. So there's a there's a um, a significant 
um, compliance mechanism there for the cable officer to follow. And then that brings us to the, the accelerated build or the additional build out based on, on market success. So again, starting with those quarterly meetings, if the penetration rate of CenturyLink is um, at or above 27.5%, then uh, their uh, mandatory build commitment will increase by 15%. So in the slide that you can see in front of you now and um, is an example, and that same example is actually in the cable franchise. So for example, if, if uh, CenturyLink comes to the uh, quarterly meeting with the cable officer and shows that uh, CenturyLink is capable of providing cable service to 60% of the households in the city and is hitting a 30% penetration rate mark, then a, an additional uh, mandatory build requirement of 15% will be added on to that 60%. So it's possible that when you get to the quarterly meeting, whether it's the first one or a subsequent one, um, that in this example, the, um, the mandatory build would increase from 60% then to 75% of the city. And that would continue moving forward as we, um, as we move throughout through the term of the franchise until the entire area of the city is served. <clears throat> Because CenturyLink is um, in the process of building out its system to be able to provide cable service throughout the city, there isn't a specific line extension requirement. There is a line extension uh, requirement in the Comcast franchise because they are completely um, uh, built out subject to the, um, to the line extension. But um, over time, um, when, this, when CenturyLink hits certain marks, then the city will have the, um, the discretion to uh, require a and determine, require and determine a, a line extension requirement of CenturyLink that is the same or similar to Comcast current line extension. One of the issues raised at the public hearing and, and um, identified in the cable officer report is a concern about economic redlining or cherry picking. Again, um, concern with a company um, picking out neighborhoods in a city uh, based on income. And um, that, um, that kind of behavior, um, as noted in the, in the public hearing and in the cable officer report, is absolutely prohibited by federal law. It is, it is uh, addressed in the CenturyLink franchise and it's addressed exactly as it's addressed in the Comcast uh, cable franchise. Um, there is one uh, additional commitment that CenturyLink agreed to and they agreed to a $500 uh, per day penalty uh, for the violation of, of that particular um, section of the franchise, um, as well as the, uh, the build out section that I just, um, I just went over. <clears throat> so the level playing field uh, statute, as, as I mentioned before, no new franchise can be uh, more favorable or less burdensome as it relates to franchise fees, area served, and access television commitments. And uh, in this case, uh, the franchise fees that CenturyLink has agreed to are exactly the same as uh, Comcast's um, franchise fee commitment in its uh, cable franchise. The area served is the same area, meaning the whole city, of course, subject to the build out over a reasonable period of time. The PEG commitments <clears throat> are somewhat different between the two franchises. Um, I would suggest that um, the CenturyLink has, uh, in some instances, um, committed to greater commitments than Comcast currently has. Um, the number of access channels being provided by the companies are the same. Uh, there are nine access channels in the city, uh, and that will be the same um, between Comcast and CenturyLink. The format of those access channels, meaning how those channels are delivered to subscribers, um, it can be different. So if the, if the city provides these um, nine channels in HD format, high definition format, then CenturyLink will provide all of those channels in high definition. That's a little bit different than, than a Comcast commitment. Comcast is committed to, to providing um, three of the nine uh, channels uh, in HD over a period of time. Electronic programming guide is a, um, 
is identical in commitments between uh, CenturyLink and Comcast. Channel placement is a little bit different. When, um, when there are subscribers in the city subscribing to uh, CenturyLink's product, there'll be something that we call in the franchise the Minneapolis Mosaic. And what that means is uh, there's a channel that acts as a gateway to all nine access channels that the city has. So when um, a subscriber goes to channel 14, they'll see this channel, which is currently channel 79 on the Comcast system. And it's kind of the big picture. And then they'll see a number of other live channels on the side of that. And subscribers will be able to choose from any of those nine channels uh, to go whatever channel they want to, all from channel 14. Uh, it's a little bit different than Comcast because they have a little bit different technology in how they deliver um, their programming. The, the access channels will be physically located uh, in the 8,000s. Um, and uh, it is a little bit different than how Comcast is, um, is required to have their, uh, their channels. For example, their HD channels are required to be uh, near the broadcast channels, for example. There's a commitment by both Comcast and CenturyLink to provide public service announcements. Uh, there is also a commitment by both companies to provide video on demand programming uh, for city programming. The CenturyLink uh, commitment, however, is significantly more than Comcast, as you can see. CenturyLink will be providing over 200 hours of video uh, on demand programming more than uh, Comcast. Comcast's current commitment is 10 hours. That may increase to 20 hours but CenturyLink's commitment is 25 hours per channel. Uh, with nine channels, that's uh, 225 um, video on demand hours. And then finally, the PEG support, um, the, uh, the PEG fee that the city receives in support of its um, access television um, is the same um, in amount at $1.50 um, for both companies. Diverse programming, uh, the need for culturally diverse programming in the city was um, something that was also identified in the public hearing on the cable franchise application and in the uh, cable officer's report. The city is fairly limited in how it can require programming. Um, for example, we can't require specific um, programming, but we can require broad categories of programming, and that's what we did in the CenturyLink cable franchise. And we specifically uh, indicated that uh, CenturyLink is required to have um, culturally um, diverse programming on its uh, on its cable system. Uh, Comcast does not have um, a similar provision. So we move then to a comparison uh, between the CenturyLink franchise and the Comcast franchise, and um, the the two franchises are very similar in nearly all res in really nearly all respects. Um, but I will go through a handful of uh, terms that are different, and many I've already gone through during the, um, the presentation. The first is the term. I did mention that we have a five-year term that is different than Comcast franchise. Comcast franchise uh, was for 12 years. The CenturyLink franchise is for five. And the primary reason for having a shorter uh, franchise term really is to, um, to monitor how the build-out of the city um, uh, progresses. Customer service, uh, there's a different customer service standard that CenturyLink has agreed to and that they've agreed to having a customer service office here in the city of Minneapolis. Um, Comcast does not have such a, a franchise commitment and actually recently um, closed their customer service office, um, which was disappointing to staff. Um, there's an identification, an additional indemnification uh, provision in the cable franchise, as I uh, mentioned before. I just went over the, um, the differences in the access commitments. There's a provision on complementary service to uh, public um, to public buildings. Um, and they're similar language, but not identical. The uh, penalties and liquidated damages and dispute resolution uh, sections are virtually identical with the exception that uh, CenturyLink has agreed to a, um, an additional um, penalty provision related to build out and uh, economic redlining. 
Of course, the build out um, provision is different. Uh, Comcast does not have a build out section since they've already built out their cable system here in Minneapolis. I also mentioned um, that there's a difference in line extension commitments and uh, also just talked about the broad categories of programming that we uh, required in the CenturyLink franchise, but it's not in the Comcast franchise. So that leads us to what our next steps are. And I think Matt um, identified that in his initial remarks, but um, the committee needs to act on whether to approve or deny the, the CenturyLink cable franchise and then direct staff to draft findings consistent with um, with your decision. And as Matt said, we're, we have to uh, wait a period of seven days after the public hearing on the cable franchise before the city can act. So that takes us um, to the next council cycle. And at that time, then the council can issue a decision. And with that, um, that's my presentation for today. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Um, Otherwise, we can move to the, the public hearing and hear from CenturyLink and the public. Thank you very much, Mr. Bradley. Uh, before we do open the public hearing, we do have some questions from council members. I know it's council member Yang, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Chair. Uh, Mr. Bradley, um, I saw that, um, you know, with regards to CenturyLink, um, there would be monthly meetings um, in 2016, and they would be willing to show maps and documentation. and. I'm just wondering, um, you know, when they do show the maps and documentation, then are those going to be public um, information? I mean, can that, they be shared with the public by that point? Um, Mr. Chair and uh, Council Member Yang, um, I think that's yet to be um, determined. It'll be up to CenturyLink to label anything that they provide to the city as a trade secret and non-public, and we'll address it at, at that time. Okay, and and that's really the reason why we haven't seen or the public hasn't seen any maps of uh, where the coverage area is and anything like that at this point, right? And trade secrets? Mr. Chair, Council Member Gang, that is correct. Although CenturyLink did provide some documentation to the committee indicating uh, on a ward by ward basis where um, they expect to, um, uh, to, to be able to provide service and to the number of homes below that fall below the median income. Anything further? Just check. Okay, thank you. Any other questions before we open the public hearing from council members? Not seeing any. I'm just in advance. Thank you for all of your work, Mr. Bradley. Of course, Mr. Lively is our communications officer, and Mr. Gitter from the uh, city attorney's office. So let's see where we're at now. Okay. I'd like to uh, take this time to uh, open the public hearing officially. There's uh, folks who would like to uh, speak at this public hearing. They may do so. We've got a couple of people signed up. Um, we'll begin with Mr. Rhodes. If you could uh, introduce yourself uh, with uh, your name and address for the record, please. Good afternoon, uh, committee members. My name is Pete Rhodes, and I reside at 2214 Blaisdell in Minneapolis. Uh, let this be entered into the record. I'm glad to be here today on behalf of BMA Cable Networks, the owners, the staff, and the communities that we serve. Mr. Chair, I present this notice in writing to thank the Ways and Means Committee uh, and cable officers, staff who have been granted the authority to speak uh, as a voice for our communities uh, to ensure equitable service, deployment, minority programming, as well as economic opportunities. Uh, I thank you for your due diligence in crafting uh, somewhat of a cable franchise that is clear and concise uh, that attempts to work uh, for the citizens uh, of our great city. I submit as well in support of BMA Cable Networks the letters uh, for the records from uh, Pastor Billy G. Russell, the president of the Minnesota Baptist Convention, uh, Convention uh, Kevin Quarles, the general manager for KMOJ FM, uh, Tracy Williams Dillard, the publisher and CEO of the Minnesota Spokesman Recorded News, along with Al McFarland of the Insight News, uh, Derek Stevens, a former BMA intern who is now currently the production manager at NPR as The Current. Lewis King, president of CEO Summit Academy of YC. Charmaine Russell, uh, Charmaine Russell, so let's say uh, a Caldwell banker, real estate agent. Uh, the NAMI champion and artist here who, we freak, who is freaking on our channel as well as 
um, Reverend Alfred Babington Johnson, the president and CEO of Stair Step Foundation. And of course, the supporters in attendance here and the tens of thousands of BMA uh, network audience members who support our channel, BMA Cable Networks, the only minority owned and operated service that provides local, cultural, specific programming for arts, music, education, news, and youth training opportunities since 1984. So the communities are not covered concisely or not covered fully by the majority <coughs> media in our communities. Today, we respectfully ask that this committee and the city council uh, later use their authority as our community voice uh, to ensure equitable service, deployment, minority programming, and economic opportunities as well in building, marketing, and the inclusion of BMA cable networks on the systems within the ordinance for the cable systems as an integral provision. I understand that the committee, as well as the council, cannot specifically um, tell the cable systems uh, that will be getting franchise or, or trying to get franchise agreements uh, what type of programming they have. But I hope that you will support uh, as you have uh, uh, equitable uh, deployment as well as cultural specific programming for which we have been providing here in the Twin Cities now for some 30 years. Uh, with that, I will uh, enter these letters uh, for the record on behalf of our supporters and we again thank you and I'm willing to answer any questions that you may have uh, for me in regards to our channel. Uh, if not, uh, again, thank you for your work and time. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, we appreciate all of the work uh, that BMA and its member networks uh, provide to the city. And it's uh, cultural diverse programming is, uh, is paramount to the city's interest in carrying that message forward. So I thank you for your uh, presence here today and for all of your work all year long. Thank you. Mr. Lively, that's gonna be important for us, right? That's right, that's what the cable officer says. Uh, we have another uh, gentleman, I think, uh, signed up here. I, I'm having trouble with the last name. So it's going to be Tom, who lives on Groveland Terrace. There he is. If you could introduce yourself and your address uh, for the record. Yes, my name is Tom Gitta, and actually I'm here on behalf of uh, an organization called uh, Minnesota Multicultural Media Consortium. And uh, I have my, I'm also president and publisher of Mshale, which is the African Community Newspaper. Uh, but today I'm here on my capacity as the chairman, actually, of the multi Minnesota Multicultural Media Consortium, uh, of which uh, Pete Rhodes, who just spoke, uh, is a, also a member. I just want to put on record uh, what the members of the consortium are, uh, so that uh, that goes on the record as well. So Insight News, Latin American Today, uh, Monk Today, um, Shala Newspaper, African News Journal, Asian American Press, The Circle, BMA Cable Networks, La Raza 1400 Radio, and Telemundo, Minnesota. Uh, so those are the members of our consortium. And I'm here to, call, uh, to go on record saying that uh, what, uh, what Pete Rose just said, uh, the consortium is 100% behind. Uh, just want that to go on record. Uh, because our, our concern really is more to do with the diverse programming uh, to ensure that that uh, makes its way if uh, this franchise is, is granted. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your testimony. Are there others who are interested in speaking at today's public hearing? <coughs> Representatives from CenturyLink. I was expecting. Uh, yes, Mr. Evening. Chairman and members of the committee, my name is Jim Campbell. I'm the Regional Vice President for Regulatory and Legislative Affairs for CenturyLink. And with me is Dwayne Ring, the Regional President uh, who lives here in Minnesota. Tyler Middleton, who's the Vice President and uh, uh, General Manager for the the Minnesota area, uh, Mary Lefebvre, who's leaving uh, both the room and the company as of this Friday, which makes me very angry. Uh, Kirsten Searsland, Patrick Haggerty, and Joanna uh, Hoffling is here uh, from CenturyLink. I, I too want to commend staff on the work that they did over the course of the last few months in negotiating this. Uh, both Peter and Michael have been uh, wonderful to deal with, very responsive. Uh, and I think Michael did a great job of going through the terms of the franchise. I certainly don't want to repeat that, but I want to echo uh, the sentiments we expressed at last meeting that we are excited about bringing competition here and uh, consumers are even more excited about us coming in here. And so they're, they're the ones that are going to reap the benefits of that. With that, I'm here to answer any questions. Certainly don't want to repeat what we said in March. So, thank you. Are there any comments or questions? It's unusual that we would have a give and take, but there's always welcome, given that 
as the applicant of the franchise. Thank you very much. Thank you. Comments and for being here. Anyone else who would like to speak? Yes, sir. If you could just uh, let us know your name and address, please. Yes, uh, my name is Mahmoud Warder. I live in Minneapolis, 2929 Chicago Avenue South. I really thank you the hard work you have done as a Ways and Means Committee and I also staff. Staff, thank you very much for, you know, going all the details and going through. And we haven't seen the map yet. So we still have the concern that 30% with neighborhood will be. So we are still have a concern. Just to let you know, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Anyone else? Last time. I can officially close the public uh, hearing portion of the meeting. Um, and uh, just to uh, provide any uh, opportunity for discussion amongst, amongst committee members, I'd like to move the action to uh, uh, grant the uh, franchise uh, for CenturyLink, as well as the other items. I'm a little lost in my paperwork here. which would be to uh, <clears throat> held the public hearing, taking action to recommend the uh, proposed CenturyLink cable television franchise ordinance, uh, direct staff to prepare the findings consistent with the committee's recommendation, and if the franchise ordinance is approved, authorize proper, proper city officials to execute the cable television franchise agreement with CenturyLink. Are there any questions or comments from council members on that item? Council Member Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think overall uh, having another cable service provider in the city is going to be helpful for residents in terms of lowering the costs of service and providing additional channels. And from that regard, competition is a really great thing. Uh, I uh, am a little disappointed that we started at a 30% rollout. Now we're at 15% rollout across the city. And I don't think that has anything to do with our uh, negotiators on our side, but more so Century Link's uh, position on the topic. And uh, I also know that uh, while fiber optic internet is a separate uh, issue from this, I know that that's kind of been caught up in the conversation around uh, rolling out this cable service, the fiber optic internet, which is great, great for the economy. It's great for consumers. Uh, it's great for businesses. It's, it's just great all around. It's a uh, really high speed, uh, reliable internet service. And I keep receiving all these mailers from CenturyLink and getting emails about it, uh, about gigabit internet. And I just want to say it, I hope you really put some serious resources into rolling it out across the city because right now it kind of feels like there's more money being put into marketing than to actually rolling it out. And I hope that we can really see that pushed out for our residents uh, for the sake of everyone in the city and uh, increased competition, better service and prices. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments? Council Member Bender. You know, I have a question. Um, I was able to have a briefing about this and this issue of culturally diverse programming came up, but um, I think this is addressed in the agreement under these broad programming categories section, but could you talk about how all of these things will be sort of negotiated as we go on. This isn't a commitment to any sort of specific percentage of programming or anything, and um, just sort of the likelihood that you think that these broad programming categories would be implemented as they're detailed here in 3.8. Mr. Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Council Member Bender. Um, yeah, like I uh, mentioned earlier, we're, as a city, we're really limited in, in how we can require specific programming. If we could, uh, you know, if we could require BMA to be on a CenturyLink um, cable system, um, you know, I think that would that would be something we would have looked at, but it just simply isn't. So really, we can only require these very broad categories of service. So when you look at the franchise, you'll see things like um, Minnesota News or, and uh, sports programming. And, um, you know, there's a kind of a laundry list of, you know, maybe eight different types of broad categories of service. Um, as we move forward in the in the cable franchising um, relationship with Century Lake, assuming that we do, um, you know we'll be able to to look at their programming. 
Um, you know, there may be comments from um, citizens that to the cable officer or to the council that indicates they're unhappy with, um, you know, maybe a, a lack of programming in, in these certain areas. And that's when we'd be able to, you know, look at that and, and look at whether or not um, CenturyLink is actually providing culturally diverse uh, programming to the city. Um, you know, it'd be nice if we could have a little bit more authority in that area, but unfortunately, um, we don't under the Federal Cable Act. Okay, thank you. I mean, I think with all of these where I'm coming from, I, I really appreciate the five-year uh, piece. I think that's a really important thing along with the quarterly meetings to help make sure that we're reaching all of these goals. I hope that um, CenturyLink will be responsive and as this moves forward. I did have a bit of a concern about this um, market share where that landed, uh, I would have liked to see that lower, but you know, again, this was a negotiation, so um, I'm comfortable with where it landed. I, I think we all would have liked to see a little bit more, um, you know, specific commitments, but uh, with these quarterly meetings, I feel comfortable that we can work to make sure this um, is in good shape for the five year uh, review period and sort of our next decision point. So appreciate all the work that's gone into this. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Yang. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Bradley, could I get you up there again? Sorry. I um, wanted to follow up on uh, Councilmember Bender's question with regards to the nine uh, <clears throat> multicultural programs that mm -hmm. um, are going to come from CenturyLink. Um, so does that mean that CenturyLink gets to provide those nine, I guess, channels of multicultural programming, or is that us that does that? Uh, Mr. Chair and Councilmember Yang, it's up to CenturyLink to to meet the obligations in the franchise. So it's up to them to determine and to provide um, specific programming that meets each identified broad category of programming. So it's up to them to decide, um, you know, how they're going to provide a category of service related to Minnesota News, for example. It's up to them to decide how they're going to provide sport packages. It's up to them to provide uh, how they're going to provide culturally diverse programming. It'll be up to us ultimately to, as we review compliance, to determine whether or not they're actually complying with the franchise compliance. Okay, so let me let me get clarification on that. So those <clears throat> nine channels are not going to be something like a public access channels where let's say nine different groups get to say, you know, I'd, we're going to use this channel to provide, let's say, Somali programming. This group to provide Spanish uh, language programming. And nothing. It's not going to be like that, though, right? And, Mr. Chair and Councilmember Yang, correct. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair, um, I just want to make a comment with regards to this. Uh, you know, kind of uh, to piggyback on uh, Councilmember Johnson's uh, points, um, you know, I, I think, I mean, the city of uh, Minneapolis would benefit from some sort of competition uh, in this area. And so, you know, I I guess, you know, when I look at this um, Franchise agreement, you know, it's it's unusual in the sense that uh, it's a five-year franchise agreement instead of you know, let's say a twelve-year, and you know, in in that five years, I mean, I, I think it it gives a short time period for CenturyLink to really uh, act out its values and also act out the values of the, the city of Minneapolis. And you know, I'd love to just see, you know, what happens in those five years, and you know, after five years, I mean, we can uh, go back to the negotiating table to see, you know, whether they've done what they've uh, promised to do and. You know, hopefully, I mean, everything works out uh, perfectly, but in these situations, I mean, we just never know uh, what what will happen. And, you know, I mean, I, I think, you know, they, they came at this in good faith, just like our folks went at it in good faith. And, you know, I, I, I think, I mean, with regards to the 15% instead of 30% rollout, um, you know, I, I'm just going to look at it as, you know, I think for for them, I mean, it's just, you know, I set expectations low and just exceed them just, you know, completely. So, I mean, that might be a good thing. But, uh, you know, I think the competition is going to be good for the city of Minneapolis. Thank you. Further comments or questions? Not seeing any. All those in favor of the motion to uh, for those four sets of actions, including the approval of the CenturyLink franchise, please say aye. 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 Uh, opposed? That item carries. So that will be brought forward to not this coming Friday's council meeting, but the uh, one uh, two weeks after that to keep in line with our uh, council cycles as well as uh, complying with state law. So thank you very much again for the uh, applicants, uh, for the uh, uh, incumbent, and for our staff for doing all of this work. So thank you very much. Next item on our agenda 
is a discussion item on our merchant services program. I'll speak slowly to allow for an easy transition. This is for the merchant services contract, the recommendation from staff. So Mr. Plant, city treasurer, thank you. Please welcome and begin. Thank you, Chair Quincy, and good afternoon, council members. I'm Bruce Plant, the city treasurer, and I want to say thank you also, take this opportunity to thank all the people, many of whom are in this room that helped me through this process. Thank you. The city currently contracts with U.S. Bank Elevon for its merchant services. The current contract has been in place since April 15th, 2010. Today, I'm recommending that the city continue its merchant services partnership with U.S. Bank Elevon and ask for your approval to enter into contract negotiations. We considered several factors, including cost and quality of services, financial strength, as well as the community benefits of the providers. The RFP was published on the city's website for several months and nine responses were received. I engaged staff from various city departments for the RFP evaluation, and I also assembled a, committee sub, a community subcommittee to assess the community benefits portion of the RFP. U.S. Bank was the top proposal in all major evaluation categories, including the recommendation from the community subcommittee. So thank you for the opportunity to give you this, my recommendation today, and I stand ready to take any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Plant. Any questions for uh, Mr. Plant? Thank you very much. Thank you. I will uh, do a, something slightly unusual. It's not a public hearing, but Mr. Rosenthal, if you'd uh, like to make any comments, you're welcome to. Now that I've introduced you, you have to. So come up and say something. <laughs> Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I, I wasn't aware that I could be compelled to speak, I, <laughs> but be that as it may. Um, I just want to sort of appreciate you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Plant, uh, for the easy access to having conversations about, um, you know, how we move forward with this. I think I'm particularly pleased with the fact that there was an opportunity for community input uh, to sort of consider community benefits as it, as it uh, relates to this particular contract. And I'm confident that as we move forward and look at the contract we currently have with Wells Fargo and a future RFP that uh, I know the city is going to be doing for other banking services, that we continue to consider how community benefits can be applied so that we can uh, come up with what I I think we could call a win-win-win for the city to get the best deal, for the banks to get a good deal, but m perhaps most importantly, a little biased, that the community will begin to see some of the gaps in banking services that exist in the community being filled, and that some of the pri priorities that we've heard from uh, the community over the course of the last year uh, through conversations they've had with we've had with them about different kinds of gaps can uh, begin to be filled. So thank you for this opportunity. Again, thanks to the city for this more open process, and we look forward to more of the same. Great. Thanks, thanks very much. We do appreciate the uh, uh, effort and uh, bringing together community members uh, as well as departments to talk about how uh, the city can do its business. And so thank you, Mr. Plant, for being open to that conversation and for your work in involving people on the RFP and uh, and certainly in the decision-making process. So thank you very much, Mr. Plant, for your, your work on this. Uh, all those in favor of uh, this action, which is execution of a contract with U.S. Bank for the provision of merchant services, processing credit card and debit card payments for the city programs and services, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Uh, opposed? That item carries. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Next item is the uh, paid parental leave policy. This is something that is brought forward by our human resources department and has gone through, as I understand it, did it go through executive committee? Yes, it did. And so this is a referral yes. actually made to the committee of the whole, but to keep this on cycle, instead of referring it back to this committee, we're gonna take this item up now. Uh, and uh, Ms. Christensen, if you could uh, provide a, a brief presentation on this topic as it relates to the financial impact of the city, I'd appreciate it. 
Uh, thank you, Chair Quincy, members of the committee. Consistent with discussion at the city's executive committee meeting last week, staff is recommending the um, implementation of a paid parenting leave program for the city's employees. This program would include up to three weeks of paid parental leave that would be granted to el eligible employees following the birth or adoption of a child. And that would be available to eligible employees, which are defined as biological parents, adoptive parents, or the spouse of a biological or adoptive parent. For the purposes of this policy, uh, registered uh, domestic partners are also considered as spouses. Also to be eligible for this paid parental leave program, an employee must be eligible to accrue sick leave and must not have been a, um, under a disciplinary action for abusing sick leave in the uh, past two years. The paid parenting time must also be used in a solid block of time. And it also runs concurrently with the other leave uh, programs eligible or uh, uh, available to the employee of the city. And the paid parenting leave must be used within the first 12 weeks of the qualifying event. The unique uh, uh, quality of this program is that unlike many other organizations, the um, leave policy that is being brought before the council this week is um, eligible for people who still have balances of their other leave, meaning that we do not require that uh, employees utilize or draw down their balances to nothing before they're uh, able to tap into this benefit. They are, um, it's available to them immediately. From a financial cost uh, perspective, there is not an overt budgetary impact associated with this paid parental leave because the city is in the practice of budgeting 100% payment of a full year's worth of compensation for an employee. Rather, in the event that all of the um, estimated employees, um, approximately 90 a year, were not otherwise planning on using some form of paid compensatory time off, the cost of the program would be approximately $5,500 per employee. However, history has shown that many employees are utilizing their uh, available paid benefits, so incrementally the additional cost of this program is minimal. Thank you very much for that uh, uh, presentation and overview. <clears throat> I'd like to move approval of this item um, so we can have uh, further comments or questions from uh, council members. Council Member Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to express my support for this and say I think it's just a fantastic move. I first became aware of this when my policy aide uh, found out that she was pregnant and having her first child and we started looking at uh, planning for that and realizing she'd have to use uh, sick and vacation days uh, for her time out of the office and while I've never had any children I would assume it's neither uh, described as either a vacation or uh, comparable to being sick you know it's something that uh, we're very happy about uh, and that's a huge moment in people's lives and so uh, I wish we could do more than three weeks, and I'm guessing maybe if we review this uh, as uh, it's rolled out and implemented, there might be some future discussion at some point uh, about the length of time. And uh, I'm just very supportive and want to thank staff for all their work on this and uh, the mayor's office and uh, council members who have helped bring this forward. Thank you very much. Council Member Yang. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, if I may ask some questions for uh, Ms. Christensen. Um, you know, so this this is retroactive to uh, January 1st of this year, uh, which means, let's say, you know, if I have a staffer who uh, took some time just because, you know, of a, a child, I mean, in that situation, um, do they just get that block of time back? Uh, Chair Quincy, Council Member Yang, the staff direction associated with this proposed policy would provide for a mechanism to make whole any individuals who were required to utilize their paid benefit time uh, prior to the implementation of this policy. And as you articulated, it is intended to be retroactive to January 1st. So um, <coughs> we've yet to uh, identify that mechanism, but that is part of the um, intention of the program. Okay, and Ms. Christensen, uh, you had said that uh, with regards to this uh, three weeks of paid leave, uh, you'd, you'd have to use it within the first uh, 12 weeks, right? Correct. Okay, and so if you don't use that, I mean, you can't bank that, you just lose it basically, right? Uh, Chair Quincy, Council Member Yang, that is correct. It is only available for use within those first 12 weeks after the qualifying event. Okay, and um, I, I thought I heard you say that it had to be used as a block as well, or can you spread that out over the 12 weeks? Chair Quincy, Council Member Yang, I will defer to our uh, benefits expert, Joyce Traber from HR, in one block. 
Chair Quincy, Council Member Yang, it's intended to be used in the three-week block. Okay. Okay. Right. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Chair, I, I think this is fantastic that we're going to adopt a policy with regards to this. Um, it's just, it, it puts us, you know, with the times, actually. I mean, I think we're a little bit behind the times on uh, something like this, and I think it's fantastic that this is happening, um, you know, with with regards to my office specifically, uh, you know, we had to figure out how to do it, uh, what to do. Uh, you know, we had to figure out uh, whether uh, my policy aid was qualified for FMLA and all that uh, crazy stuff. And, you know, this would probably solve some of the problems. And so I think it's fantastic that the city of Minneapolis is doing that. Um, I concur with uh, Council Member uh, Johnson in the sense that, you know, I mean, my goodness, I, we should have a much longer time period than three weeks, but three weeks is a good start for us, and so that I, I fully support this. Thank you very much, Mr. Councilmember Yang. Uh, I would agree. Uh, it would be great to have uh, more up front, but this is a minimal cost uh, to the city, and it really, uh, I think, helps aid in uh, the uh, recruitment and retention of employees, which is so important. Uh, in the case of your uh, council uh, aid, uh, Councilmember Yang, uh, he was a new employee. So he hadn't accrued a lot of vacation time and things like that. So this is a, a terrific way to attract and retain some of the greatest talent in the city. Councilmember Bender. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That was uh, the point I wanted to make. I think this is really important for us as we look to attract and retain a talented workforce. I really appreciate that this policy um, is focused on, on providing this for all of our employees, regardless of their gender, um, whether it's adoptive, adoptive parents or birth parents. So I think that's a really great um, elements of where we landed on this three weeks, no matter what, no matter how uh, you've become a parent. And I think it's a nice compliment to the other choices that um, folks have, especially birth women after birth in terms of using their short term disability or, um, or sick time if they are recovering from birth. So I'm also interested as we look at this over time, um, if this is enough time, I'm interested to understand if this um, using them as a block becomes a barrier. I know a lot of families that have used um, time sort of like you know first mom takes off then dad or one of the parents will spread out their time over a longer period in order to sort of transition into their child care so i'm interested in those questions as we look um, forward and review this um, after it's been in place for a while and i really appreciate all the work that went into this one as well thank you uh, on this item of the paid parental leave policy uh all those in favor please signify by saying aye aye, aye. and opposed and that item carries thank you very much uh, the next item is re revolves around the appointed uh, officials' compensation plan. I've uh, been working on this for uh, quite a while. Um, and so, first of all, I want to thank everybody, including staff, on, on the proposal that was brought forward from the executive committee. It's been a long time coming. Uh, that said, uh, there are still a few questions to be addressed before we consider moving, the, moving this item forward for council consideration. So in order to have uh, HR and other departments uh, review those and compile that information, I'd like to uh, just make uh, a motion that this uh, is deferred, uh, this item, to the June 15th Ways and Means Committee, uh, meeting to provide staff that opportunity to gather the additional information and comparison data. And I don't think we have to vote on this particular item because it's just a matter of putting something that came as a referral on a, a future committee uh, calendar. So we'll do that, and seeing no further business before us, we are adjourned.